Welcome everyone to our Every Nation Tuane Willows online service. We are so excited to have you with us. Every Nation is part of a global family that makes disciples, raises leaders and plans churches and campus ministries in every nation. There are churches in so many nations and we can all know that we are not worshipping alone. We are worshipping as a family, not just in South Africa, but globally. I think that is very exciting. If this is your very first time logging in with us today, a very special welcome to you. If you look in our comment section, you'll find that there is a link that you can complete if you are interested in getting to know a little bit more of who every nation is or if you would like somebody to contact you to get connected with us. Another thing that we as a family love to do is to celebrate. So if you had anything to celebrate in this past week, we hope you had a really great celebration. Post it in the comments so that we can pray for you and celebrate with you in this season. We are very excited to announce that we will have our REACH week this year. It might look a little bit different, but the heart behind it is exactly the same. REACH is our every nation plant and mission mandate. Um, we believe that we are called to take the gospel to Africa, Europe and to every nation, just like our name says. What this week is about is it's a week where we align our heart with God's heart for the nations. During this week, we get an opportunity to celebrate the nations, to pray for the nations and to fast for the nations. So join us this week as we pray for, give towards and go on God's mission for the nations. The dates to remember during this week is Sunday, 6 September, 9 September as well as 13 September. There will also be devotionals available for us to do together during the week. We are very excited and we hope that you can join us. Even though it looks different, the heart is still the same and we are so excited that we can still do it even in these times. We also want you to save the date, 28th August at 7 p.m. We are going to have a blast together. As our Willow 6 p.m. family, we're going to have a social. The details are still a surprise, so keep a look out on our community group for the details. But save the date, 28th August at 7 p.m. I would now like to hand over to our worship team. I would just like to pray for us. Thank you so much, Father, that we can gather together again, just as every other Sunday. And even in that in this season, your church has not stopped because church is not a building. It's the people, Father. And thank you that we can still gather together in heart and in spirit and worship you together. Father, I pray that today our worship would be a fragrant um, smell to you and that it would be pleasing to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello everyone, my name is Yulani and I'm from our Willows congregation and um, I just want to share with you something that I've been journeying with God in this week concerning church and the body of Christ and um, the specific scripture that I read was in Revelations and actually the role that the, that the church, that you, that the body of Christ plays in heaven. It was so beautiful. The first one was in Revelations 5 verse 8. Where, where the elders are holding, they say they're holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And with this, I just want to encourage you that as we are worshiping God and um, that we will also be in continuous uh, prayer as well, whether it's in your tongue or just, just praying in between, but that our prayers are presented to God in golden bowls and it's like incense. And then in 5 verse 13, he says, and I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And that's just amazing. Francis um, Chan says, it goes on and he says, the joy comes when we stand among, among those Jesus has redeemed and get the lost in uh, and get lost in a sea of worship becoming fully 
a part of something sacred. So we as the body of Christ, we as a church, we are sacred. So I just want to encourage you that even though you might be alone in your home, you are still part of the body of Christ and we are still a church. So let's just stand up everyone where you are at and let's worship and praise God.
is my God. Ek vertrouw die groot naam, die wat gloe, sal nie nooit goed beskaan. My God en wie ek gloe, op die sal ek vertrouw. want to remain in you, in your presence and in your word, Father. Your word teach us to abide in you. And that's what we want to do, Jesus. We want to b- abide. Brand new earthquake before Move by sound of his voice Seas that are shaken and stirred Will be calmed and broken for my regard Through it all, through it all My eyes are on you Through it all, through it all it is well
his name It is well with my soul It is We do not want anything because you are more than enough. Even if we have nothing, even if there's uncertainty, even if there's sacrifice, even if there's loss, you are more than enough. And in all of that, we can say, we can truly say that it is well. You are beautiful, Father. We adore you. And we stand as a body of Christ. We stand together as a church today, here and now. And we worship you. And we thank you for who you are. Amen. Hello, family, and welcome to our Willows Evening Service recording. We are streaming 
uh, live and premiering on Facebook. Uh, you can also check us out on YouTube. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much to the band for leading us in an incredible time of worship through music. It is awesome to be with you all. And um, I am trusting that God is present and in each of your lives and, and just in this time as we're really needing and desiring some personal interaction. I pray and trust that, that you are finding some time with God and some interaction with Him and His imminent presence with you that you have not been able to do in, in, in another time. So um, I hope all of you are doing really well and um, let's get into today. So we are in a series called Focus, thinking about what you're thinking about. And it's aimed at our, at our uh, thought life, all right? our minds, the way we're thinking, the things we're thinking. The whole concept is if you can change the way you think, you can change your life. Um, what, what you live out there is first decided and meditated upon in here. So uh, just a question, why do we need to change as individuals? Because we're aiming at transforming our physical lives by transforming our minds. Why do we need to change? Well, if you're an unbeliever, I would say, a person who doesn't believe in Jesus, I would say, look around you and see that there is definitely something wrong in this world. And as long as there is something wrong, I would say that it is truly our moral obligation to become better for the world and to continue to improve. Now, for, for those who believe in Jesus, we know that, that He has called us to be like Him in character and transforming more and more to be like Him. And so, as long as I'm on this earth, I will constantly be striving to be like Christ. And that is only possible if we change our minds, if we transform the way we think about things. Look at our, our series scripture, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. I'm just going to read verse 2. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by tasting you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Ever wondered what was God's will for you in certain situations? Change your mind. Think about the things that we've been speaking of in the past couple of weeks. If you want to change your behavior, change your mind. Think about the things we've been speaking in the past couple of weeks. Speaking of week one, what we spoke of is, have you lost your mind? <laughs> um, and we just, we just looked at the effect that our thought has on our physical life, okay? Um, Look at the power of our mind, the, the effects of our minds, um, the way we're thinking, and that our mind, our, the way we think, is not just an uncontrollable reaction of chemicals, but it is actually a controllable um, force in our minds, thing in our minds that we can control. And it's almost like, um, like, like a, a tree, you know, the, the, kind of, the kind of soil, the kind of uh, water, all of that determines how it's going to grow. And which tree you choose to water, that one's going to grow. It's the same with what I let enter my mind. That's the way my mind is going to be cultivated. Week two, we looked at mastermind, how focusing on the truth of God can transform the way we think and therefore transform the way we live. So how to master our minds. Now this week, I want us to, to speak about something that has really convicted me a lot while preparing for this series and that has helped me so much. And it's got to do with the way that we react in certain situations, okay? So um, week one and two has got to do with our basic behavior, how we act in everyday situations. Today's got to do with how we react to certain situations. And so I'm going to be speaking about something we call cognitive biases. All right. So, so what is a cognitive bias? It is, it is also called our mental filter or framework. It is a mistake in reasoning based on our personal preferences or our beliefs. Okay. Our personal preferences or beliefs. Um, when we have a mental framework that is not necessarily accurate, then our wrong thought process or belief causes us to make mistakes or error in the way that we judge certain situations or things. Um, for example, um, my fiance and I, Riza, uh, one time when we were getting ready to, to go somewhere, uh, she had to take off her glasses and I was ready and she looked at me and she said, Wow, I don't know if the colors of your dress there is going to match and you look a little bit uh, unneat, you know. Um, and I said, just, just put on your glasses, love. And she put on her glasses. She says, oh, 
you look very nice. I said, why don't you come over here and just tell me a little bit more about how nice I really look. And uh, we'll celebrate that. Now, I'm just kidding, but it's got to do with the filter that she has on while looking. And it's the same that uh, with life, the way that we look at life, the way we perceive such and situations has to run through the filter that we have. Now, that filter is motivated or, or decided upon by certain beliefs that we have in our lives. Okay, My beliefs determine my filter. It determines how I view this situation. If I have wrong beliefs, I'm going to act wrong because I'm going to make wrong assumptions about what someone is doing to me, how they're speaking to me, what they think about me. I'm assuming the wrong things because I already believe the wrong things about myself. So I'm going to act in a wrong way because of my beliefs and because of what I believe this person is really thinking. And that is our cognitive biases, is that we have a preconceived filter to the way that we are reacting to life situations. All right. So different people in the same environment and same situations will respond differently. For example, at your work, your boss might call in two employees. Okay. They give the exact same criticism about the exact same situation and the two employees will respond differently. The one will take complete offense and say, um, who does he think he is to tell me this? I'll tell him what he really is and how he looks and, and they will take complete offense. While the other employee, same situation, same criticism, will say, wow, thank you so much for helping me recognize a blind spot in my life. Now I can improve. It's not the facts that are different about the situation. It is the filter, the way that the people view it. Not the facts are different, but the filter. I'll give you another example. Two people, two different kinds of people will be watching this video or joining our church once we can gather again. And uh, the one person will walk in and, and say, oh, all Christians are hypocrites. The pastor is probably not even living what they're preaching. Look at how terrible the, the decor is. Churches are so irrelevant to modern society. And I don't even like the institutionalized church. Look at what they're wasting their money on. While another person could be walking in and say, Everyone struggles, but God is still good and God works in different ways and, and God is using people. And, and wow, um, I pray that people who walk into this church, may they be changed, whether this is my family or not. Which one of those two people do you think are going to have a better church experience? Which one of those two people do you think are really going to experience God through the whole service? Studies have shown that even our relationship with our earthly fathers can sometimes determine or color in the way we view God as a heavenly father. For example, if you had a father who was very authoritative, um, uh, dominating, forceful, very disciplining, um, not very interested in your life, then you are going to struggle to view those things of God's character since the Bible speaks of God as a father. And so your cognitive bias that was formed by the way that you experienced your father will determine the way you view our heavenly father. While a person who has had a good father that, that loved them and cared for them and, and was always interested in their lives and, and would teach them about Christ and would pray for them and would encourage them, would find it easier to experience the character of God as a good father. It's not the facts that are different. For these two people, God is still the same. He is still good. But the way they perceive Him are different. It's not the facts, but the filter that is different. So this week's topic, we are speaking about reframing. Reframing our filters and our cognitive biases. Reframing the way we view certain situations, the way we act in certain situations and the way that we um, look at different relationships. So with that being said and with that introduction, let's quickly pray and ask God to transform our hearts. Father, I pray that every person listening to this message will be convicted in their heart of hearts to view situation through the filter that you want us to follow. I pray that each one of us will be able to recognize our biases through this message. We'll be able to lay it down and recognize it for the lies that it is. That we'll be able to view life through the lens of your goodness. Father, I pray for open hearts and for your love to transform hearts through this message. 
in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So I want to give you a good example here also of a good positive cognitive bias or or filter. So uh, a kid, for example, could be playing in the background and and he's playing cricket and he says, um, I am the greatest batsman in the world. I am the greatest cricket batsman. He picks up a ball and he throws it in the air and he swings and he misses the ball completely. And he says, it doesn't matter. I'm still the greatest batsman that has ever lived. Everyone misses once in a while, takes up the ball, throws it up, misses it a second time and says, I am still the greatest batsman in the world. I just wasn't paying attention. But now if I pay attention, I am going to hit this ball like the greatest batsman. He throws the ball in the third time and he hits it and he misses and he says, wow. I didn't know, but I am also the greatest bowler in the world because I just bowled out three times the greatest batsman in the world that has ever existed. Okay, and this is a good framework of positivity, probably not realistic, but really good in the way that we view our um, our world. Now, another way of reframing your cognitive bias is that you can say it, it's, it's called, and you can Google this because I don't know exactly what all of these words mean. Um, it's called perceptual accentuation, okay? Or you can call it cognitive restructuring. Today, I'm going to call it thinking differently, okay? So, um, to give you another analogy, um, uh, this was a, this past time I was actually in Cape Town for a wedding, which was an awesome time. And I had a great conversation with a guy and his girlfriend um, in which they, they shared with, with us just some things that's going on in their relationship. And, and what they shared was um, what would happen is uh, the girl would really want her boyfriend to be interested in her. Okay, and he would say he's very interested in her and in her life. But now she would go to write a test and she would go and have her nails done. She'd do do a couple of things on her um, on the day. And then um, he would come and he would speak to her and he would say, how was your day? No, it was good. Okay, great. And then he goes on and she would feel like, why didn't he ask? Why did he not ask? how my taste went, how my nails look, do I feel pretty, um, how I, my emotions is going at the moment. Why, why doesn't he ask these things? Does he even care? Your cognitive bias in that relationship is going to determine your answer to that question. Why is he not asking? If you have a negative, then you are probably going to say, he's not asking because he's not interested, because I'm not interesting. And he probably doesn't even like me. Now that would be motivated by a belief that I'm probably not likable or a hurt that I've had in a past relationship. Or, and that, that, that whole negative view would, would make you feel insecure in the relationship. While the truth is this guy is really interested. If you're positive, you have a positive cognitive bias or a positive view or framework from which to view the situation. When you ask the question, why did he not ask, you would say, he probably doesn't know that I really like that he asks. Or this probably doesn't come naturally to him because he was raised in a home where never was their real interest showed in him. So he doesn't know how to express his interest towards me. Maybe he just forgot, but he still cares. You see, that's, that's the difference between having a positive and a negative way that I view certain situations and a different framework. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this in the alphabet, okay? This is the A, B, C, Ds of thinking, the way we think. And I'm gonna use a personal story of mine to walk through this. Now, the A is the activating event. Now, throughout life, we all encounter uh, different situations and things um, and events. And, and these events, we sometimes feel uh, experienced to be stressful and they are called stressors. Okay, so when we have these stressors, these events have the ability to really challenge us in a certain way. Now, for me personally, um, when I came into ministry at Every Nation, I was given a lot of responsibility. Okay, and there were a lot of things that I needed to do and people I needed to reach and people I needed to see and meetings I needed to have. And there was a whole ministry, the youth ministry that I had to develop. And there was this massive weight I placed on my shoulders. Really stressful. Okay, let's go to the B. My belief. 
Now, this is the thought that is brought to mind in this event. Now, for me personally, I believe that I was not doing a good job. I was not able to do this. I was not able to take this responsibility. I'm actually a failure and no one really likes me. And I need to make a massive success of this ministry in order to receive people's approval. That was my belief. Okay. I'm a failure. I do not have ideas. I need to make a massive success of this in order for people to like me. It is up to me to finish the work and make a success of it. Now let's go to see the consequent emotion that follows from this. This situation, these false beliefs made me feel, left me feeling discouraged. I felt tired. I felt like a failure. And those were the emotions that came because in the end, I ended up not finishing everything I wanted to finish. And so I felt like a failure. This brings us to D. The dedicated behavior in this situation. What I do is I avoid my boss. <laughs> I avoid the situation. I avoid the responsibility. I probably just crawl up in the fetus position and I use anything I can to just try and distract myself from the way I have failed. Um, the way I have failed in my work and not finishing everything. Now... The truth is that I am not a failure at all. In fact, in ministry, and I almost want to go as far to say that in every situation in our work, it is God that does the good work through us. We are able to surrender our work and say, I'm going to honor you with my work, Lord. And the way that I work, will you do it through me? The responsibility is in your hands and I will obey and sit down and do my work as far as I possibly can. And if I do not finish in time, I am your son. I am loved by you. I am redeemed by you. And so I can face this whole situation, apologize for dropping my, my responsibilities, find a way to see it through, delegate the work, find another way, but I do not have to run away from it. I do not have to, to feel like a failure. I do not have to live in those lies. Because if I do not see this truth, then this cycle is just going to continue. My behavior, the bad behavior, encourages my beliefs back to be that um, I'm a failure. And that takes me back to the emotions, back to trying to avoid the situation and back to the behavior. And the whole cycle just continues over and over. So here is the question we need to ask in today's message. How will we interrupt that cycle? Now, if there was anyone who was great at reframing a situation, it was the Apostle Paul. Okay, he had a very simple prayer plan and that was to go to Rome because he believed if he could go to Rome and he could he could influence and preach the gospel to the leaders of the world in that time, the, the most influential people, then from that place, he could get the gospel out to the whole world. It's as simple as that. Lord, get me to Rome, preach the gospel, change the world. Okay, pretty simple plan. And so Paul did go there, but not as he thought he would. He went to Rome as a prisoner and he was imprisoned in Rome and subsequently imprisoned to be executed. Some of us have experienced a similar situation. Maybe um, you had an idea or plan of what your life is going to look like. You said, um, by the age of 25, I'd like to be married. By, by this time, I'd like to have a job and be successful and would be this kind of job. I'd be an architect or an engineer or a scientist or I'm going to be a pilot or... I'm going to do this and by, by the age of 30, I'm going to have three children. And by age 34, I'm going to, I'm going to already be wealthy and be a millionaire. And, and you've had all these plans and I want to see the world and I want to travel to the seven continents of the world. And, and then life happened and the situation, your circumstances did not exactly turn out as you thought it would. And... Maybe some of you had a plan, life happened, it went bad, and you're stuck where you are. And, um, and this is where Paul was. He had a plan, didn't turn out the way he would like, 
And now he was stuck. Now, what he could have said was, this sucks. The gospel is dead. I have failed. My life is at an end. There's no more hope for me. There's a couple of things he could have said. But in our scripture for today, Philippians chapter 1, we're going to read what he really said. All right. So let's read Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 to 14. Verse 12 says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, as in being imprisoned in Rome, not the way that I wanted it to go, what has happened to me, I didn't get the job that I wanted to get. What has happened to me, I'm not as wealthy as I want to be. What has happened to me, um, I married my high school sweetheart. It's not going really well at the moment. What has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Verse 13, and as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. The whole palace guard. I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. You see, Paul knew that he could not control what is happening to him, but he can control the way he frames it. He can control the way he views it. He is in prison, but we see that the gospel was being proclaimed in a way that we would never have imagined had he not become imprisoned. And I said this in a previous message as well. Paul knew, and he said it here, that because every eight hours I get a new Roman official, it has become known to every single Roman official that has ever been chained to me that I am in chains for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Friends, you cannot change or control what happens to us, but we can control the way we frame it and the way we view it. So I want to give three principles today to help us reframe our relationships and the way we view situations in life. The first point that I want to give for us to reframe is that we need to thank God for what did not happen. Okay, so for example... There was a university girl who phoned up her parents. She was on her way home and, um, and she had some news to give them. She sat them down. She told her parents, um, so I've got a little bit of bad news for you. I went out to a bar recently, got a little bit drunk, went home with the guy. We slept together and I'm pregnant. Okay. The good news is as soon as he's out on parole, <laughs> he's going to get a job. He's going to go to rehab. We're going to have the children and we're going to try and raise them together. Okay. Parents mouth are wide open. They cannot believe what they're hearing. The girl says, I want you to know that none of what I said is true. The truth is I got 55% for chemistry, but I just wanted you to know that it could have been a lot worse. Okay. Sometimes we need to thank God for what did not happen. Okay, if we are doing a domestic travel, I'm at an airport, the plane is broken down, um, we are delayed. Oh man, my whole life is going to end. No, I will much rather be down here with a broken plane wanting to be up there than be up there wanting to be down here. Okay, we can thank God for what did not happen and we can reframe our minds in that way. Second point that I want to give is we need to pre-frame the way we're going to react to a situation. Okay, We prepare ourselves the way that we're going to view the situation. Now, I'll give you this example um, of what happened to me personally and how I've learned to pre-frame certain situations, especially when it comes to motivation in sports. Okay, uh, Many of you will know that I used to um, run athletics, uh, compete on a national level and sometimes on an international level. So in 2014, I went to Stellenbosch and I ran the SA Junior Championships there. Okay, And on paper and in the field, I was one of the fastest athletes and a real medal contender. When I got to the track, the wind was blowing extremely. 
it was it was a massive gust of wind i need to run a 400 meter and so at some points you're gonna have the wind from behind but at some points and in this instance on the home straight the toughest part of the race you're gonna hit it from the front and you're already feeling like you're running into a wall okay i got so stressed by these conditions i ran my race i did not even qualify for the final let alone get a medal and so the other athletes saw me as Christian the choker, okay? Christian chokes, he does not have big match temperament. He chokes when, this, when, when the going gets tough and when there is pressure. Now, I went and I sat in my quiet time with God and I believed His Holy Spirit told me, Christian, do not own that label. You have the advantage of having experienced tough situations and pressure when you need to perform. And once you have failed, you know how it feels. You know what to do. You know how to be successful when the going gets tough now because you learn from this experience. Okay. Fast forward one year, 2015. This is not the SAS Junior Champs anymore. It is the Senior Champs. The fastest of the fastest. Um, Wade van Niekerk was running in that race. And here I am. And this year on paper, not even in the top 10. And not a medal contender. And the wind is blowing again. Now, before I went to the track, I decided, Lord, this time I'm going to hold on to the scripture that you're giving me at that point. It was um, in Jeremiah. Um, which says, uh, even youths grow weary and tired, but those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up on wings like eagles. And I'm like, Lord, I'm going to soar like an eagle. The more the wind blows, the higher the eagle can soar. And that's what I'm going to do. And I arrive at the track. The wind is blowing. Instead of responding, oh man, I'm going to hit that wall in the final 100 meter. I say, no, I'm going to soar higher like an eagle and I'm going to fly over this track. Okay. I run in the semifinals. I run the best race of my life in the worst conditions. I qualify for the final. And I run in the final in a terrible lane. And I run my best time of my life by almost a whole second. Now in athletics terms, that's a lot. Okay. God is with us. And we can choose beforehand when situations get tough. The way I'm going to react is in the light of God's goodness. It's in the light of God's motivation. I'm going to take his word literally and I'm going to believe and I'm going to push through. And this is the way I'm going to re pre-frame this situation. That should the wind be there? Should my boss be angry? Should I receive criticism? Should I be late? Should I fail in a subject or a, or a test? Should that happen? I'm going to view it in light of God's mercy and goodness. And that brings me to my third and final point. We need to look for God's goodness. Here is a promise. Friends, if you want to see the bad or the negative, if you want to see what is bad or negative, I promise you, you will see it. You will see it. What you're looking for, you are going to find. If you want to be critical about a certain organization, you can take any organization, our church, any organization out there that is a great organization and you can pick it apart. What you're looking for, you will find. If you are looking for where God is working, where God is good, where He is busy, where His Spirit is leading and guiding, you will find it. You'll find what you're looking for. You can choose to look for the good in certain relationships. You can choose to look for the good in people, the good in relationships, um, in situations, and you will find it. It's, it's like uh, comparing a vulture and a hummingbird. Okay? A vulture. What does a vulture find? Carcasses, dead animals, stinking stuff. Why? Because it's looking for it. That's what it's drawn to. What does a hummingbird find? Nectar, sweet things. It'll fly right over the dead carcass and find the good thing. Why? Because that is what hummingbirds look for. That is what they're looking for. Now, I want to encourage you all to truly let Jesus help you determine the meaning of the things that happen to you. 
um, when we, any, any good psychologist will tell you, you, by the way that you think, determine what something means to you. The way that when something happens, you determine what it means. You determine whether it's good or bad. You determine whether it's going to change your life for the good or the, or, or the bad. You can determine that. I want to ask you to let Jesus do that. And close off with a story. At Craig Rochelle in... Um, Preaching on a lot of the same that I preach now. He mentions a story about a couple in his church, Rance and Heather. And what happened was Heather got sick. They were at home. Uh, she felt sick. Uh, there was medication in the car for her. Uh, Rance ran out, grabbed the medication, came back into the house. And she was passed out on the floor. Phoned the, the ambulance. The ambulance came. Long story short, she never recovered. And she passed away at the age of 38 with children leaving her husband behind. Now that's a really bad day. That's a really bad situation. Okay. Now, Craig Rochelle wrote a book called Hope in the Dark, Believing God is Good When Life is Not. And he was struggling to get this book out to be sold on Amazon. There was a high demand for the book, higher than what they expected at first. And um, the printers, uh, something broke, got stuck, couldn't print, couldn't get the stock out. Amazon was contacting him. He couldn't get back to them. And so he was just extremely frustrated with the fact that he could not get this book out to people who really need it. And so... Um, and so him having these frustrations and the way he is viewing this whole situation is unawares of what's going on behind the scenes. This couple and the husband losing his wife. Now somewhere between her death and her funeral, something came in the mail. Now Heather, she liked to shop, as a lot of ladies do. And online she bought a book that was not available when she bought it, but it became available a while after she, she passed away, just before her funeral. And so that day, the mailbox uh, pin went up and her husband went out to fetch what was waiting for her in the mailbox, waiting for him. And here it is, a book called Hope in the Dark, Believing God is Good When Life is Not. And at exactly the right time, exactly the right moment, at Rance's worst moment in his whole life, God delivers something good that he could have hope in the situation. He started reading that book and he realized how God was using his wife's death to transform people's lives and to point people to him that they may have a relationship with him. And, and here Craig is sitting and he's angry at this small thing and here is this couple and God is being good. And so this whole story, the husband runs, tells to a lot of people and so many of them get saved by this story. How good is God and that he uses our worst situations when we see that there is no hope, when we are just negative about it. If we look for God's goodness in those situations, he is able to change it into good. I want to close off by reading this encouragement for believers and people who do not know Jesus yet. This is the truth of God and the way we can view His goodness because this is His scripture read in the way that He is speaking. In, 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 in the Bible, God says this, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I am your refuge and strength. I am an ever-present help for you in trouble. I am your strong tower. The righteous, the righteous will run to me and they are safe. My goodness is great and I have stored it up for those who love me and those who fear me. I hide you in the secret place of my presence. From the conspiracies of man, I keep you secretly in a shelter from the strife of tongues, people swearing at you. I am good. I am ready to forgive. I am abounding in loving kindness. If you would call upon me today, will you call on him today? Will you be willing to accept his invitation to view every single situation in your life? in light of His goodness and in light of His kindness. 
Will you trust him in the circumstances of life? Friends, he really loves you and he desires you. And with that, let me pray for us and close off. Father, thank you that you are good. And thank you that this is what I read now. This is your word. It is true and it will never fail. Father, I pray that people hearing this message will be able to view the situations that they're going through. The bad that maybe this whole pandemic, maybe relationships that we have inflicted on them in life. May they look to your goodness and see God is good regardless of my situation. I pray, Father, we will be a people who are positive, not just for the sake of positivity, but for the sake of representing who Jesus Christ is to a lost and broken world that desperately needs you, Jesus. I pray that will you transform hearts from this message? Will you be close to people? Will you transform our lives and transform our minds? In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good day, family. Um, thank you so much, Christian, for that wonderful message. Friends and family, as um, he was sharing the word, God just really revealed to me and showed me how ready he is to really unveil his goodness to us. He reminded me of a scripture in Psalms that says the, the, the earth is full of the goodness of God. And right now, friends, I really want us to be practical about what Christian shared. So I'm going to share a few practical applications you can apply during this week, during your quiet time, really make an effort to apply this in your life and in your personal time with God. So the first thing I, I want us to do is to gather your biases. Now this can this can happen anytime during the day when when you see that you have a certain bias um, over over something. You become aware of the negative reactions during the day. The, the second thing you can do is to reflect on the lies that motivate your reaction. So if you see that there was a situation and you reacted in a certain way, you can ask yourself, why did I react in this, in this way? So you can reflect on the, on the lies of and identify the lies you believe that actually motivated your reaction. And then when, when you sit down, you can replace those lies with the truth. So what really helps me is to write it down and to identify the lies, um, maybe on the one side of the page and at the other side of the page, um, replace it with the lies and draw a cross over the, the lies and say, these lies are covered in the blood of Jesus. And no longer will I believe these lies, but rather I will choose to reflect and to, to believe these truths about God's word. And then, um, like we said um, last week, to think it, confess it and believe it. Almost seven times, not almost, about seven times a day. What also works very well is to maybe play, put a reminder on your phone and to remind yourself, oh yes, it's time to reflect. What is the truth about God? I believe um, about, uh, about this situation or this bias or whatever it is that you identified. Family, I hope this week is filled with so much of God's goodness as He just places His lens upon your eyes for your eyes to open up and to see Him in every situation. I believe that there will, be, will come testimonies and testimonies of God's goodness as we just seek Him with all our hearts. May I have such a spirit-filled awesome week. See you next week.